reading Questions of the Third Cinema. Edited by Jim Pines and Paul Wilman. Towards a Critical Theory of Third World Films by Tashom H. Gabriel. Whenever there is a filmmaker prepared to stand up against commercialism, exploitation, pornography, and the tyranny of technique, there is to be found the living spirit of new cinema. Wherever there is a filmmaker of any age or background ready to place his cinema and his profession at the service of the great causes of his time, there will be the living spirit of new cinema. This is the correct definition which sets new cinema apart from the commercial and from the commercial industry because the commitment of industrial cinema is to untruth and exploitation. The Aesthetics of Hunger, Glober Rocha, Brazil. Insert the work as an original fact in the process of liberation. Place it first at the service of life itself ahead of art. Dissolve aesthetics in the life of society only in this way, as Frantz Fanon said, can decolonization become possible and future or and culture, cinema and beauty, at least what is of greatest importance to us become our culture, our films and our sense of beauty. Toward a third cinema, Fernando Salinas and Octavio Gatino, Argentina. France Fanon, in his attempts to identify the revolutionary impulse in the peasants of the third world, accepted that culture is an act of insemination upon history, whose product is liberation from oppression. In my search for a methodological device for a critical inquiry into third world films, I have drawn upon the historical works of this ardent proponent of liberation, whose analysis of the steps of the gene genealogy of third world culture can also be used as a critical framework for the study of third world films. This essay is, therefore, divided into two parts and focuses on those essential qualities third world films possess rather than those they may seem to lack. The first part, the first part lays the formulation of third world film culture and filmic institutions based on a critical and theoretical matrix applicable to third world needs. The second part is an attempt to give material substance to the analytical construct constructs discussed previously. From pre-colonial times to the, to the present, the struggle for freedom from oppression has been waged by the third world masses, who in their maintenance of a deep cultural identity have made history come alive. Just as they have moved aggressively towards independence, so has the evolution of third world film culture followed a path from, quote, domination, end quote, to, quote, liberation, end quote. This genealogy of third world film culture moves from the first phase in which foreign images are impressed in an alienating fashion on the audience to the second and third phases in which recognition of, quote, consciousness of oneself, end quote, serves as the essential antecedent for national and more significantly international consciousness. Therefore, or there are, therefore, three phases in this methodological device. Phases of Third World Films. Phase one, the unqualified assimilation. The industry. Identification with the Western Hollywood film industry. The link is made as obvious as possible and even the names of the companies proclaim their origin. For instance, the Nigerian film company Calpany, whose name stands for California, Pennsylvania and New York, tries to hide behind an acronym while the companies in India, Egypt, and Hong Kong are not worried being typed the, quote, third world's Hollywood, end quote, quote, Hollywood on denial, end quote, and, quote, Hollywood of the Orient, end quote, respectively. The theme, Hollywood thematic concerns of, quote, entertainment, end quote, predominate. 
Most of the feature films of the third world in this phase sensationalize adventure for its own sake and concern themselves with escapist themes of romance, musicals, comedies, etc. The sole purpose of such industries is to turn out entertainment products which will generate profits. The scope and persistence of this kind of industry in the third world lies in its ability to provide reinvestable funds and this quadruples their staying power. Therefore, in cases where a counter cinematic movement has occurred, the existing national industry has been able to ingest it. A good example is in the incorporation of the quote cinema novo end quote movement in the Brazilian Embra film. Style, the emphasis on formal properties of cinema, technical brilliance, and visual wizardry, overrides subject matter. The aim here is simply to create a, quote, spectacle, end quote. Aping Hollywood stylistically more often than not runs counter to third world needs for a serious social art. Phase two, the remembrance phase, the industry. The indignation and control of talents, production, exhibition, and distribution. Many third world film production companies are in this stage. The movement for a social institution of cinema in the third world, such as, quote, cinema mod, 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 mod jahid, end quote, in Algeria, in Algeria, quote, new wave, end quote, in India, and, quote, engage or committed cinema, end quote, in Senegal, in and Mozambique exemplifies this phase. The theme, return of the exile of the third world source of strength, i.e. culture and history. The predominance of filmic themes such as the clash between rural and urban life, traditional versus modern value systems, folklore and mythology identifies this level. Sambini Us Usman's early film Mandabi, about a humble traditional man outstripped by modern ways, characterizes this stage. Bravo Vento, quote, The Turning Wind, end quote, a poetic Brazilian film about a member of a fisherman's village who returns from exile in the city, is a folkloric, a folkloric study of mysticism. The film from Burkina Faso, Upper Volta, Wendy Cooney, quote, God's gift, end quote, attempts to preserve the spirit of folklore in a brilliant recreation of an old tale of a woman who is declared a witch because of her conflicts with custom when she refused to marry after the disappearance of her husband. While the most positive aspect of this phase is its break with the concepts and propositions of phase one, the primary danger here is the uncritical acceptance and, or the uncritical uncritical acceptance or undue romanticization of ways of the past. It needs to be stressed that there is a danger of falling into the trap of exalting traditional virtues and racializing culture without at the same time condemning faults. To accept totally the values of third world traditional cultures without simultaneously stamping out the regressive elements can only lead to a quote can only lead to quote a blind alley end quote as Fanon put it and falsification of the true nature of culture as an act or agent of liberation therefore unless this phase which predominates in third world film practices today is seen as a process a moving towards the next stage it could develop into opportunistic endeavors and create cultural confusion. This has been brilliantly pointed out by Louis Ospina of Colombia in his self-reflexive film picking on the people in which he criticizes the exploitative nature of some third world filmmakers who peddle third world poverty and misery of festival sites in Europe and North America in North America and do not approach their craft as a tool of social transformation. An excellent case and point is the internationally acclaimed film Piox or Piox Piox Pixote by Hector Pixote 
Babin Co. According to a Los Angeles Times correspondent in Rio de Janeiro, De Silva, the young boy who played the title role of the film, was paid a mere $320. The correspondent writes, quote, in real life, a drama or in a real life drama, a juvenile judge in Diadema, a sur suburb in Sao Paulo last week, released the Silva, now 16, to the custody of his mother after his arrest on charges of housebreaking and theft, end quote. According to De Silva's mother, who sells lottery tickets for her living, quote, after a trip to Rio, when he got no work, he told me, quote, mother, they have forgotten me. I am finished, end quote, end of quote. In the meantime, Mr. Babinco, the now famous film director, was about to shoot his next feature, The Kiss of the Spider Woman, in collaboration with producers in Hollywood. The style. Some attempts to indignize or in, indigenize film or the style. Some attempts to indigenize film style are manifest. Although the dominant stylistic conventions of the first phase still predominate here, there appears to be a growing tendency to create a film style appropriate to the changed thematic concerns. In this respect, the growing insistence on spatial representation rather than temporal manipulation typifies the films in this phase. The sense of a spatial orientation in cinema in the third world arises out of the experience of and, quote, endless, end quote, world of the large third world mass. This nostalgia for the vastness of nature projects itself into the film form, resulting in long takes and long or wide shots. This is often done to constitute part of an overall symbolization of a third world thematic orientation, i.e. the landscape depicted ceases to be mere land or soil, and acquires a phenomenal quality which integrates humans with the general drama of its existence itself. Phase three, the combative stage, the industry, filmmaking as a public service institution. The industry in this phase is not only owned by the nation and or the government, it is also managed and operated and run for and by the people. It can also be called a cinema of mass participation, one enacted by members of community speaking indigenous language, one that espouses Julio Garcia Espinosa's polemic of, quote, an imperfect cinema, end quote, that in a developing world, technical and artistic perfection in the production of a film cannot be the aims of or the aims in themselves. Quite a number of social institutions of cinema of the third world some underground like Argentina's, quote, Sin Liberation, end quote, and some supported by their governments, some supported by their governments, for instance, quote, Chile Films, end quote, of Alan, Alan D's popular unity socialist government exemplify this phase. Two industrial institutions that also exemplify this level are the Algerian Lofis National Por la Com Carmos et l'Industrie Cinematographique, ONCIC, and Cuba's Institute of Film Art and Industry, ICAIC. The theme lives and struggle or lives and struggles of or yeah i said it right lives and struggles of third world peoples this phase signals the maturity <coughs> this phase signals the maturity of the filmmaker and is distinguishable from either phase one or phase two by its insistence on reviewing film in its ideological ramifications a very good example is Miguel Litton's The Promised Land, a quasi-historical mythic account of power and rebellion, which can be seen as referring to events in modern-day Chile. Likewise, his latest film, Al Sino in the Condor, combines realism and fantasy within the context of war-torn Nicaragua. The imagery, in one way or another, by the late Sarah Gomez-Yara, 
of an iron ball smashing down the old slums of Havana not only depicts the issue of women slash race in present day Cuba, but also symbolizes the need for a new awareness to place the old oppressive spirits of machismo, which still persists in socialist Cuba. The film Sol, Sol, Soleil O by the Marit Mauritanian filmmaker Med Hondo aided by the process of Fananian theses comes to the recognition or comes to the recognition of forgotten heritage and the display of the amalgam of ideological determinants of European quote humanism end quote racism and colonialism. The failure of colonialism to convert Africans into quote white thinking blacks end quote depicted in the film reappears in a much wider symbolic form in this later film. West Indies, where the entire pantheon of domination and liberation unfolds in a sharp symbolic of the or in a ship symbolic of the slave ship of yesteryear. The style film as an ideological tool. Here, film is equated or recognized as an ideological instrument. This particular phase also constitutes a framework of agreement between the public or the indigenous institution of cinema and the filmmaker. A phase three filmmaker is one who is perceived of and knowledgeable about the pulse of the third world masses. Such a filmmaker is truly in search of a third world cinema, a cinema that has respect for the third world peoples. One element of the style in this phase is an ideological point of view instead of that of a character as in dominant Western conventions. D. Calvacanti by Glober Rocha, for instance, is a takeoff from, quote, Quarup, end quote, a joyous death ritual celebrated by Amazon tribes. The celebration frees the dead from the hypothetical tragic view modern man has of death by turning the documentary of the death of the internationally renowned Brazilian painter D. Calvacanti into a chaotic slash celebratory montage of sound and images, Rocha deftly and directly criticized the dominant documentary convention, creating in the process not only an alternative film language, but also a challenging discourse on the question of existence itself. Another element of style is the use of flashback, although the reference is to past events, it is not stagnant, but dynamic and developmental. In the promised land, for instance, the flashback device dips into the past to comment on the future. So, so that within it, a flash forward is inscribed. Similarly, when a flash forward is used in Sambini Cito, 1977, it is also to convey a past and future tense simultaneously to comment on two historical periods since the past is necessary for the understanding of the present and serves as a strategy for the future. This stylistic orientation seems to be ideologically suited to this particular phase. It should, however, be noted that the three phases discussed above are not organic developments. They are enclosed in a dynamic which is dialectical in nature. For example, some third world filmmakers have taken a contradictory path. Lucia, a Cuban film by Humberto Solis about the relations between the sexes, belongs to phase three. Yet Solis's latest film, Cecilia, which concerns an ambitious mulatto woman who tries to assimilate into a repressive Spanish aristocracy, is a regression in style, glowing in spectacle, and theme, the tragic mulatto towards phase one. Moving in the opposite direction, Global Rocher's early Brazilian films like Deuce A or Diabo, Na Terra do Sol, literally, quote, God and the Devil in the Land of the Sun, end quote, but advertised in the United States as, quote, Black God, White Devil, end quote, exclamation point, and Terra M. Trans, quote, the earth trembles, end quote, reflect a phase two characteristic, while his latest two films, A 
Adad de Terra, quote, the age of earth, end quote, and the Calvacanti, both in their formal properties and subject matter, manifest a phase three characteristic in their disavowal of the conventions of dominant cinema. According to Global Rocha, a I did de Terra, which develops the theme of Terra in trance, and de Calvacanti disintegrates traditional, quote, narrative sequences, end quote, and rupture not only the fictional and documentary cinema style of his early years, but also, quote, the world cinema, cinematic language, end quote, under, quote, the, di the dictatorship of Coppola and Godard, end quote. The dynamic enclosure of the three phases posits the ex existence of gray areas between phase one and two and two and three. This area helps to identify a large number of important third world films. For instance, the Indian film Man or Man Mathen, quote, the Churning, end quote, the Senegalese film Zala, quote, Spell of Impotence, end quote, the Bolivian film Cha or Chu Chuquiango, Indian name for La Paz, the Ecuadorian film My Aunt Nora, the Brazilian film They Don't Wear Black Tie, and the Tunisian film Shadow of the Earth occupy the gray area between phase two and three. The importance of the gray areas cannot be over overemphasized. For not only do they concretely demonstrate the process of becoming, but they also attest to the multifaceted nature of third world cinema and the need for the development of new critical canons. Components of critical theory. From the above, it can be seen that the development of third world film culture provides a critical theory particular to third world needs. I would like to propose at this stage an analytic construct consisting of three components that would provide an integrative matrix within which to approach and interpret the three phases drawn out from the third world's cultural history. The components of critical theory can be surmised as follows. Component one, text, the intersection of codes and subcodes the chief thematic and formal characteristics of existing films and the rules of that filmic grammar, and the transformational procedures whereby new, quote, text, end quote, emerge from old. Component two, reception, the audience, the active and interrogation of images versus the passive consumption of films, the issue of alienated and non-alienated identity, and the ideal slash inscribed or actual slash empirical spectatorship illustrates this component of critical theory. Component three, production. The social determination where the wider context of determinants informs social theory, market considerations, economic production, state governance, and regulation composes this stage of the critical constructs. Here, the larger historical perspective the position of the institution of indigenous cinema in progressive social taste is context. The overriding critical issue at this juncture is, for instance, the unavoidable ultimate choice between the classical studio system and the development of a in the development of a system of production based on the lightweight 16 millimeter or video technology. The pivotal concern and the single most significant question at this stage, therefore, is, quote, precisely what kind of instruction is cinema in the third world, question mark, end quote. Confluence of phases and critical theory. Each phase of the third world film culture can be described in terms of all the three components of critical theory, because each phase is necessarily engaged in all the critical operations. For instance, phase one is characterized by a type of film that simply mirrors in its concepts and propositions the status quo, i.e. the text and the rules of the grammar are identical to conventional practices. The consequence of this, <clears throat> the consequence of this type of 
quote, mimicking, end quote, in the area of, quote, reception, end quote, is that an alienated identity ensues from it precisely because the spectator is unable to find or recognize himself slash herself in the images. The mechanisms of the system of, quote, production, end quote, also acknowledge the status quo. The reliance is on the studio systems of controlled production and experimentation. If we apply the components of critical theory to mass or to if we apply the components of critical theory to phase two, only a slight shift in the text and the rules of the grammar is noticeable. Although the themes are predominantly indigenized, the film language remains trapped, woven and bloated with classical formal elements and remains stained with conventional film style in terms of, quote, rec- in terms of, quote, reception, end quote, the viewer, aided by the process of memory and in amalgam of folklore and mythology, is able to locate a somewhat diluted traditional identity. The third level of critical theory also composes and marks the process of the indignization of the institution of cinema, where a position of self-determination is sought. Finally, the three components of critical theory find their dynamic wholeness in phase three, the combative phase. Here, the text and subtext go through a radical shift in transformation. The chief formal and thematic concerns begin to alter the rules of the grammar. Another film language and a system of new codes begin to manifest manifest themselves. With regard to, quote, reception, end quote, we discover that the viewer or subject is no longer alienated because recognition is vested not only in genuine cultural grounds, but also in an ideological cognition found on the acknowledgement of the decolonization of culture and total liberation. The intricate relationships of the three phases of the evolution of third world film culture in the three analytic constructs for filmic institutions help to establish the stage for a confluence of a unique aesthetic exchange founded on other than traditional categories of film conventions. See figure one. Summary of the developments of film, culture, and filmic institutions. Distinctive, intersecting, integrative. Here, A and B find themselves... In a larger historical perspective, C it is a wider context of indigenization and self-determination, which conditions levels A and B to give up their position of dominance to C, a stage which composes and marks the union of third world film culture in the social institutions of cinema. This new third world cinematic experience, experience inchoate as it is, is in the process of creating a concurrent development of a new and throbbing social institution capable of generating a dynamic and far-reaching influence on the future socioeconomic and educational course of the third world. I contend that the confluence obtained from the interlocking of the phases and the critical constructs reveals underlying assumptions concerning perceptual patterns in film viewing situations. For instance, which res- with respect to fiction films showing in third world theaters, rejection on cultural grounds forces incomplete transmission of meaning. That is, the intended or inscribed meaning of the film is deflected and acquires a unique meaning of its own. The mode of address of the film and the spectator behavior undergo a radical alt- alteration. Therefore, What has been presented as a, quote, fiction, end quote, film is received as it were a, quote, documentary, end quote. The same fiction film screened in its own country of origin, however, claims an ideal spectatorship because it is firmly anchored in its own cultural references, codes, and systems and symbols, a classic example of how films from one culture can be easily misunderstood and misinterpreted by a viewer from another culture is Global Rocha's The Lion Has Seven Heads, The Leon Have Sept Cabezas. The film was extensively exhibited in the West. One catalog compiled in 1974 crediting Rocha with 
bringing, quote, the Cinema Novo to Africa for this third world assault on the various imperialisms represented in its multilingual title. Characters include a Black revolutionary, a Portuguese mercenary, an American CIA agent, a French missionary, and a voluptuous nude woman called the Golden Temple of Violence, end quote. Again, a recent compendium of reviews, Africa on Film and Videotape, 1960 through 1981, dismisses the film completely with a one-liner, quote, an allegorical farce noting the bond between Africa and Brazil, end quote. Yet, Global Rocha, in an interview given to the prominent film historian Rachel Gerber, author of Global Rocha Cinema, Politica, A or E. A. Aesthetica do in Consciente in Rome, February 1973, and in a discussion with this author at UCLA in 1976, said that the film is a story of Che Guevara, who is magically resurrected by Blacks through the spirit of zombie, in spiritual name of the late Emil Cabral. To Rocha, the film is, in fact, an homage to Emil Cabral, thus while the West looks at this film as an offering of cliched images and an object of curiosity, the filmmaker is only trying to affirm the continuity of the third world's anti-imperialist struggle from Che Guevara to Cabral and beyond to initiate an awareness of their lives and the relevance to us today of what they struggled and died for to the extent that we recognize a history of an unequal or of unequal exchanges between the South and the North, we must also recognize the unequal, quote, symbolic, end quote, exchanges involved. The difficulty of third world films of radical social comment for Western interpretation is the result, A, of the film's resistance to the dominant conventions of cinema, and B, of the consequence of the Western viewers' loss of being the privileged decoders and ultimate interpreters of meaning. The Western experience of film viewing, dominance of the big screen and the sitting situation, has naturalized a spectator conditioning so that any communication of a film plays on such values of exhibition and reception. The third world experience of film viewing and exhibition suggests an altogether different route and different value system for instance, Americans and Europeans hate seeing a film on African screens because everybody talks during the showings. Similarly, African viewers of film in America complain about the very strict code of silence in the solemn atmosphere of the American movie theaters, how the system of perceptual patterns and viewing situations varies with conditions of reception from one culture to another, or how changes in the rules of the grammar affect spectator viewing habits is part of a larger question which solidifies and confirms the issue of cultural relativism and identity. The confluence of the phases and the constructs also converges on the technologically mediated factors of needed production apparatuses, productive relations, and the mechanisms of industrial operations. It needs to be stated outright that, quote, technology, end quote, as such does not in itself produce or communicate meaning. But it is equally true to say that, quote, technology, end quote, has a dynamic which helps to create ideological carryovers that impress discourse language, i.e. ideological discourse manifests itself in the mechanisms of film discourse. By way of an example, it is possible that a filmmaker have the idea of, quote, filmic form, end quote, before having a, quote, before having, quote, a content, end quote, to go along with. The, thir the or third world films are heterogeneous, employing narrative and oral discourse, folk music and songs, extended silences and gaps, moving from fictional representation to reality, to fiction. These constitute the creative part that can challenge the ideological carryovers that technology imposes. From the needs of third world film criticism, contemporary film scholarship is criticized on two major fronts. First, contemporary film theory and criticism is grounded in a conception of the, quote, viewer, end quote, 
subject or citizen derived from psychoanalytic theory where the relation between the quote viewer end quote and the quote film end quote is determined by a particular dynamic of quote familial end quote matrix to the extent that third world culture and familial relationships are not described through psychoanalytic theory third world filmic representation is open for an elaboration of the relation quote viewer end quote quote slash quote film end quote on a or on terms other than those founded on psychoanalysis the third world relies more on an appeal to social and political conflicts as the prime rhetorical strategy and less on the paradigm of Oedipal conflict and resolution. Second, on the semiotic front, the Western model of filmic representation is essential, is essentially based on a literary or written conception of the scenario, which implies a linear cause effect conception of narrative action. However, third world oral narratives founded on traditional culture are held in memory by a set of formal strategies specific to repeated oral face-to-face -face teachings. It is no longer satisfactory to use existing criteria, which may be adequate for a film practice. Western, in this case, now at a plateau of relevance to elucidate a new and dynamic film convention whose upward mobility will result in a tonality or in a totally new cinematic language. The third world experience is thus raising some fundamental concerns about the methods and or commitment of traditional film scholarship. The third world filmic practice is therefore reorganizing and refining the pictorial syntax and the position of the quote viewer end quote or spectator with respect to film. The third world cinematic experience is moved by the requirements of its social action and context and marked by the strategy of that action. We need, therefore, to begin attending to a new theoretical and analytic matrix governed by other than existing critical theories that claim specific applications for universal principles. Cultural contamination is a deeply rooted human fear. It smells of annihilation. Spiritual and traditional practices have a terrific hold, hold on the third world rural populace. This reminds us of the, of the maxim which was enunciated by Confucius in the 6th century BC and still prevails. Quote, I'm a transmitter, not an inventor, end quote. To the third world, spirits, magic, masquerades, and rituals, however flawed they may be, still constitute knowledge and provide collective security and protection from forces of evil. Unknown forces for the rural community can only be checked or controlled if they can be identified. One way of readily understanding what third world culture is, is to distinguish it from what it claims not to be. We call at this juncture for a thorough and comparative analysis of, quote, oral, end quote, or, quote, folk, end quote, art, form, and, quote, literate, end quote, or, quote, print, end quote, art, form, to situate the foregoing discussion on critical theory into focused attention. I propose here to re-examine the centrifugal as well as the centripetal cultural forces that might determine not only film, but also the media in the third world. This dialectical, not differential or oppositional conception of cultural forms takes into account the dynamics of their exchange. Several factors ensue from the examination of the two modes of cultural expression. While, for instance, the community issue is at the heart of the third world traditional culture, the issue of the individual is at the base of the Western or print culture. With regard to performatory stage pre presentation, a Western actor interacting with the audience breaks the compact or marginal boundary because as or because a special kind of magic centers or because a special kind of magic enters a playing space, 
Western stage performance does not allow crossover. While, therefore, a stage person feels his privacy violated with interactive drama, in the third world context, the understanding between the viewer and the performers is that the, their positions are interchangeable without notice. Ah, uh, for the old in the third world culture is very much in evidence. Several films reflect it, the old or the aged as repositories of third world history, is well documented in such films as Imite or Imitai from Senegal, They Don't Wear Black Tie from Brazil, Shadow of the Earth from Tunisia, and The In-Laws from the People's Republic of China. The issue of the aged in the third or in third world culture is beautifully illustrated in Safi Faye's film Fad Jal where the opening sequence of the film states, quote, in Africa, an old man is dying <clears throat> like a library burning down. In app quote, in Africa, an old man dying is like a library burning down, end quote. A major area of misunderstanding, if we take two, if we take into account the, quote, cognitive characteristics, end quote, of the, quote, folk slash print slash art, end quote, dichotomy in table one is the definition and replacement of, quote, man, end quote, the individual within third world societies. For any meaningful dialogue centering on third world developmental schemes, the issue of, quote, man slash woman, end quote, in a society must be carefully debated. As Julius K. Nair of Tanzania puts it, quote, the purpose of, is man, end quote, and as the Wallaf saying goes, quote, man is the medicine of man, end quote. A cultural orientation of, quote, man, end quote, the individual as changeable and capable of effecting change is a condition that reverberates in all advanced societies of the world, be they of capitalist or socialist persuasion, the idea that man, both in the singular and in the plural, has the capability of controlling his slash her own destiny and effecting change by his slash her own will is a dynamic force which can alter both the patterns and work habits of a people. This concept, it may be stated, is not the opposite of the third world ideal of the primacy of the community over the individual. An excellent example is the film Beyond the Plains, where man is born by Michael Rayburn, in which a young man from the Maasai tribe in Tanzania was able to change his people's negative attitude towards education by not only doggedly pursuing, pursuing it to the university level, but also never losing contact with his people. As he grew up, he made sure he performed all the customary rites and fulfilled all the obligations demanded by his people, thus demonstrating that Western and tribal cultural education were not in incompatible. From this, it can be seen that the major difference between the third world and the West with regard to changing the community from a passive to a dynamic entity is one of approach, whereas the former aims at changing the individual through the community, the latter wants the community changed by the individual. Only time will tell which of the two approaches makes for sustained beneficial social progress. Manipulation of space and time in cinema. A child born in a Western society is encased from the initial moments of birth in purposive man-made fabricated objects. The visual landscape he experiences is dominated by man-made forms. Even the child's dolls reflect the high technology of the environment. Nowadays, a child who is beginning to learn to spell can have a computer that can talk to him and interact with him in a human way. All of these developments are based on the insistence of a society that puts a high price on individualism, individual responsibility, and achievement as most necessary. A child in a rural third world setting is born in an unrestricted natural landscape. 
from the day he or she is born, the child is dominated by untampered natural forms. Even the interior of the dwelling where the child is born is made to look like the natural environment. It is not unusual to see fresh grass and flowers lending nature's color to the child's initial world setting. The child grows in this vast universe where his place within the family and in nature is emphasized. A child born and raised in this situation is taught to submerge his individuality and show responsibility to his extended family and his community. His, uh, his accomplishments are measured not only by his individual achievements, but by the degree to which they accomplish and contribute to the social good. Culture, culture, the terms of which films are based, also naturally grows from these environmental factors. An examination of oral and literate culture in terms of film brings to light two very crucial elements of cinema, namely the concepts of, quote, space, end quote, and, quote, time, end quote. All cinema manipulates, quote, time, end quote, and, quote, space, end quote. Where Western films manipulate, quote, time, end quote, more than, quote, space, end quote, third world film seems to emphasize, quote, space, end quote, over, quote, time. Third world films grow from folk tradition where communication is a slow paced phenomenon and time is not rushed, but has its own pace. Western culture, on the other hand, is based on the value of, quote, time, end quote. Time is art. Time is money. Time is most everything else. If time drags in a film, spectators grow bored and impatient so that a method has to be found in cheat natural time. In fact, or in in film, there is achieved in editing or in film. This is achieved in editing. It is all based on the idea that the more purely, quote, non-dramatic, end quote, elements in film are considered, quote, cinematic excess, end quote, i.e. they serve no unifying purpose. What is identified as, quote, excess, end quote, in Western cinematic experience is, therefore, precisely where we locate third world cinema. Let me now identify those essential elements of cinematic practice that are considered cinematic excess in Western cinema, but which in the third world context seem only too natural. The long take. It is not uncommon in third world films to see a concentration of long takes and repetition of images and scenes. In the third world, the slow leisurely pacing approximates the viewer's sense of time and rhythm of life. In addition, the preponderance of wide angle shots of longer duration deal with a viewer's sense of community and how people fit in nature. Whereas when Michelangelo Antonioni and Jean-Luc Godard use these types of shot, it is to convey an existential separation and isolation from nature and self. Cross-cutting. Cross-cutting between antagonists shows simultaneity rather than the building of suspense. The power of images lies not in the expectation we develop about the mere juxtapositions or the collision itself, but rather in conveying the reasons for the imminent collision, where, therefore, conventional cinema has too often reduced this to the collision of antagonists on a scale of positive and negative characteristics. Third world films doing the same thing make it more explicitly an ideological collision. The close-up shot, a device so much in use in the study of individual psychology in Western filmmaking practice practice is less used in third world films. Third world films serve more of an informational purpose than as a study in quote psychological realism end quote. The isolation of an individual in tight close-up shots seems unnatural to the third world filmmaker because one it calls attention to itself, two it eliminates social considerations, and three it diminishes spatial integrity. The panning shot since a pan maintains integrity of space and time, the narrative value of such a shot renders the, quote, cut, end quote, or editing frequently unnecessary. The emphasis on space also conveys a different concept of, quote, time, end quote, a time which is not strictly linear or chronological, or chronological but coexists with it. My own observation indicates that, 
that while Western films tend to pan right on a left-right axis, Middle Eastern films, for instance, tend to pan generally toward the left, as in Al Yam, Al Yam, Morocco, and Shadow of the Earth, Tunisia. It is quite possible that the direction of panning toward left or right might be strongly influenced by the direction in which a person writes. The concept of the concept of silence, the rich potential for the creative interpretation of sound as well as the effective use of its absence is enormous in third world films. For instance, in Imatai, there are English subtitles for drums for drum me. Uh, for instance, in Emetai, there are English subtitles for drum messages, and a rooster crows as Sambini's camera registers a low angle shot of a poster of a General de Gaulle of General de Gaulle. A neat visual pun. Exclamation point. Silence serves as an important element of the audio track of the same film. It is, quote, a cinema of silence that speaks, end quote. Silences have meaning only in context as in the Ethiopian film Guama and the Cuban film The Last Supper, where they contribute to the suspension of judgment which one experiences in watching a long take. Viewers wonder what will happen, accustomed as they are to the incessant sound and overload of music of, of dominant cinema. Concept of, quote, hero, end quote. Even if a Western viewer cannot help but identify and empathize with the black laborer lead in they don't wear they don't wear black or what is it? They don't wear black tie, the lunatic in Harvest three thousand years, the lazy or the crazy poet in the Chronicle of the Years of Ember, and the militant party member in Sam Bazanga. The films nevertheless kill those characters. This is because wish fulfillment through identification is not the film's primary objective. Rather, it is the importance of collective engagement and action that matters. The individual, quote, hero, end quote, in the third world context does not make history. He or she only serves historical necessities. In summary, Table 2 brings into sharper focus the differences between the film conventions of the Third World and the West and show the dynamics of their cultural and ideological exchange. Conclusion The spatial concentration and minimal use of the conventions of temporal manipulation in Third World film practice suggests that Third World cinema is initiating a coexistence of film art with oral traditions. non non Linearity, repetition of images, and graphic representation have very much in common with have very much in common with folk cu- customs. Time duration, though essential, is not the major issue because in the third world context, the need is for films in context to touch a sensitive cultural cord in a society. To achieve this, a general overhaul of the parameters of film form is required. Should the reorganization be successful and radical enough, a rethinking of the critical and theoretical canons of cinema would be called for, leading to a reconsideration of the conventions of cinematographic language and technique. The final result would tend towards a statement James Potts made in his article, quote, is there an international film language, question mark, end quote, block quote. So far from there being an international language of cinema, an internationally agreed UN charter of conventions and grammatical rules, we are liable to be presented quite suddenly with a new national school of filmmaking, which may be almost wholly untouched by European conventions and will require us to go back to square one in thinking about the principles and language of cinematography. End of block quote. Filmmakers of the third world are beginning to produce films that try to restructure accepted filmic practices. There is now a distinct possibility of James Potts' perspective remarks coming true, and it is in anticipation of the emergence of the, quote, new national school of filmmaking, untouched by European conventions, end quote, that this paper has been written. 
already certain reactions from film critics may be regarded as a sign of this, quote, emergence, end quote. For example, a general criticism leveled at third world films is that they are too graphic. This spatial factor is part of a general rhythm of pictorial representation in most third world societies. It is therefore precisely because graphic art creates symbols in space that it enables third world viewers to relate more easily to their films. In the Chinese case, for example, the spiritual or block quote, the spiritual quality achieved in the supreme Chinese landscape and nature paintings is a feeling of harmony with the universe in which the inner psychic geog geography of the artist and the outer visual reality transcribed are fused through brush strokes into a new totality that quote, resonates with the viewer, end of block quote. Both the Chinese contemporary photographers and cinematographers have attempted to create similar syntax and effects to enhance the people's appreciation of their art. Again, the most inaccessible phase three film, the one African film that drops a curtain in front of a Western audience, and at the same time, a most popular and influential film, and at the time, a most popular and influential film in Africa is Emetai, quote, the angry god, end quote, shot in social space by the Senegalese filmmaker Sambini. The film explores the spiritual and physical tension in a rural community. To begin with, the film carries its viewers into the story without any credits, only for the entire credit to be provided somewhat 25 minutes later. Spectators have been known to leave the screening room at this point, conditioned to read the credits as signaling the end of the film. What Sambini has provided before the credits is essentially the preface of the story, like in African folktale. In addition, the ending of the film, an hour and a half later, is anticlimactic, and this occurs at the moment the film is truly engage engaging. The film simply stops. What we hear is the staccato of bullet sounds against a screen going dark. In this film, the filmmaker is forcing us to forget our viewing habits and attend to the film in context instead of the experienced framed as artistic package. A lesson is thus learned. Concerned or concern should be with the language of the quote film text end quote in its own terms and not with the skeletal structure and chronology of the film. Cinema, since its creation, has beguiled spectators by its manipulation of time. It expands, contracts, is lost, and for ground, fragmented, and reassembled. The resultant multiple-time perspectives have conditioned film appreciation as pure entertainment. There is perhaps some justification for this objective in a society whose stabilizing conditions can afford the use of the film medium solely for entertainment. The third world, on the other hand, is still engaged in a, in a desperate struggle for socio-political and economic dependence and development and cannot afford to dissipate its meager resources and or laugh at its present political and historical situation. The combative phase in which the historical determinants of third world culture occur provides us with the final horizon of a store or of a cinema oriented toward a peaceful coexistence with folk culture. That oral tradition reasserts itself in a new medium is a contribution not only to third world societies, but to the cinematic world at large. Film is a new language to the third world, and its grammar is only recently being charted. Its direction, however, seems to be discursive. Or <clears throat> its direction, however, seems to be a discursive use of the medium and an appeal for intellectual appreciation. Tomas Gutierrez or yeah, Gutierrez Alia perhaps best exemplifies the new awareness when he says, block quote, if we want film to serve something higher, if we want it to fulfill its function more perfectly, 
aesthetic, social, ethically, or ethical and revolutionary, we ought to guarantee that it constitutes a factor in spectators' development. Film will be more fruitful to the degree that it pushes spectators towards a more profound understanding of reality and, consequently, to the degree that it helps viewers live more actively and incites them to stop being mere spectators in the face of reality. To do this, film ought to appeal not only to emotion and feeling, but also to reason and intellect. In this case, both instances ought to exist indissolvably sick, united in such a way that they come to provoke, as Peshaw said, authentic, quote, shudderings and tremblings of the mind, end quote. This article first appeared in Third World Affairs 1985 and is copyrighted and is copyright of this journal. And I was reading towards a critical theory of third world films by Tashom H. Gabriel. And this was in Questions of Third Cinema, edited by Jim Pines and Paul Willman.